Um, so I, for those who didn't hear, it was just really to welcome you to our online gathering. Um, we are meeting on Zoom as usual, but we are also going to be streaming <coughs> live on YouTube. So a special thank you to those who worked hard yesterday to make this possible. Um, as most of you know, this morning's gathering will be a little different. Um, first of all, can I extend a particularly warm welcome uh, to those who are not normally part of the Connect Christian Fellowship. We are delighted uh, that you can join us and uh, please, please consider yourself part of us this morning and by no means a spectator. You uh, are welcome here. I'm glad that in the kingdom of God, there are no uh, strangers or acquaintances. There is only family. So you're welcome this morning. Um, I know most of us would prefer to be meeting uh, face to face and shoulder to shoulder uh, this week. Not being able to hug one another when we've seen each other has been particularly difficult. I know, uh, I suspect some may have mo momentarily forgotten um, the social distancing guidelines. It's times like this that meeting online by Zoom or otherwise seems particularly cumbersome and certainly inadequate. Nonetheless, we are thankful that it is just good to be together uh, this day. On Monday morning, our dear friend <coughs> and brother Martin Holly <coughs> went to be with the Lord. His sudden death has shocked us all. And the overwhelming response <clears throat> from many of us has been one of disbelief. Personally, I've struggled um, perhaps more than um, ever before to grasp the fact that Martin is no longer with us. He will no longer, we will no longer see Martin's warm smile, or at least not while we are wearing these current bodies anyway. He has gone ahead of us and made the journey that we will all make. And we, we believe that the reality is that it is us that live in the realm of shadows or phantoms. Right now, Martin is living in glorious high definition and he's enjoying the Lord's presence like never before. We, his friends, will all miss him so terribly. However, it's important for us to acknowledge that those experiencing perhaps the greatest loss are his family, uh, his amazing wife, Carol, his four formidable children, Jonathan, Stephen, Rebecca and Philip and their spouses and partners, and of course, uh, Martin's grandchildren, Martin's three sisters, Rosemary, um, Alison and Patricia, and Carol's parents, Brian and Gwyneth, and her brother Peter. Uh, I know some of the family are with us online now, and we're so thankful that you could join us. Uh, but on behalf of us, um, on behalf of the fellowship, we, we send you our love, and we commit ourselves to upholding you in prayer. Uh, I'm sure Martin uh, would have much preferred our gathering this morning to be business as usual with no big uh, fuss made of them. Uh, but when you've had such a significant impact on so many lives and lived out a life of deep, consistent faithfulness to the Lord and done so in so many spheres, I'm afraid uh, business as usual is just not possible. So Carol, uh, we want to thank you for allowing us a forum um, to simply express our thankfulness and to celebrate the gift of, of Martin's life and the joy of knowing him. In fact, this overflowing thankfulness, uh, our eternal hope, and even our joy in the midst of such pain is a precious gift that only the children of God are afforded. So this has nothing to do with being sentimental or putting Martin on some sort of pedestal or any sort of flattery. Our expression of thankfulness and joy is actually a response that is sourced in heaven itself and that actually ultimately brings glory to the Father. So taking this time together is good 
Psalm 116 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. In a moment, Paul Painter is going to speak to us. And after uh, Paul, there will be uh, an opportunity for people to share. And I'll say more about that um, when that time comes. But I just wanted to take a brief moment to address where we are in this. When someone dies suddenly, there's, of course, uh, a reaction from us. Many of us, uh, many of you have shared with me and with others your disbelief when you heard the sad uh, news this week. Some have said that it was uh, a reminder to them of just how fragile uh, life is. Some of you have gone even further and said that this has been a real wake-up call for you uh, personally. Uh, and, and I believe God's word also has something to say. If you have uh, your Bibles with you, please turn to uh, Psalm 39. In this Psalm, um, David starts off by saying that he feels that he uh, cannot speak in front of his enemies. But then he begins to pour out his heart before the Lord in verse 4. And he says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. It's as though David is saying, Lord, if I could just grasp just how short and fleeting this life actually is. Show me my life's end. Show me that my days are actually numbered. And the truth is that um, we all need our perspective and prioritize and priorities. Uh, recalibrated from time to time. We need to be reminded that this life is not it, and this is not our home. In verse 5, he says, You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everything is but a breath, even those who seem secure. In verse 6, he talks about the futility of bustling about to and fro and heaping up wealth, uh, but it's all in vain. And then in verse 7, David's focus becomes clear, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. In weeks like this, when faced with the realization uh, of this life being fleeting and numbered, um, that eventually it will come to an end and that will happen relatively soon in, in light of eternity. Uh, I think it forces us, to, forces us to respond in one of two ways. The first response is one of fear, where we uh, bury our heads, uh, in denial, we don't want things to change. Uh, and it leads to spiritual paralysis and eventually death. But when perfect love casts out all fear, there is another response possible for us. If you want to turn to Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do this? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author or pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I would struggle to think of a greater example um, of someone who has run with perseverance the race marked out for him than our friend Martin. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I'm going to pass over to you now, Paul.
Can one of the guys just give me a quick signal that the sound's okay? Great, thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, a special welcome to Carl and the family and to some of Martin's friends from other parts of the world. You're very welcome here this morning. On Thursday past, there was a family funeral service for Martin. It was intimate and simple as he wanted it to be. Each of Martin and Carl's children made personal and very moving tributes about their dad. And it was lovely to see so many uh, line the route uh, on the approach to the cemetery in honor to Martin. But this gathering is the opportunity of Martin's other family, his church family, to collectively reflect upon his death, upon his life, and upon his death. And what you hear today will be from, from within the context of Martin's influence on our church. He was a family man first and foremost, and he had, then he had a huge influence on our church. But let's remember, he also had a professional life as an optometrist, and a number of professional bodies have been in touch to pass on their condolences. He was highly respected within his profession. Once I said to him, I wanted to get my eyes tested. Uh, his quick reply was, it's too late, you've already married her. Um, and apparently on another occasion, a gentleman with eyesight only in one eye asked him if there would be a reduced price for an eye test on his good eye. And Martin Lee reportedly replied, no, because if you had three eyes, I wouldn't charge you more. Uh, we'll miss his humor, sort of, most of it. But I want to speak directly to Connect Christian Fellowship. This has been a momentous week in our journey together as a church. And I believe in time we will see this moment in even greater significance. But just now, we're trying to absorb and help one another absorb the shock and pain of Martin's sudden passing. The sudden, the sudden passing of a brother, a great friend, and a co-worker. It's almost 16 years since we've had to respond to similar shock and similar pain. And the whole family were deeply impacted then also. But there's peace and there's grace to receive. As Barry has already said, this is not a time to get caught up in hero worship and Martin would be aghast at any eulogizing on his account. But this rightly is a time to express a range of emotions that such events cause. But we want to steer clear of sentimentality. Martin would hate that. But even more importantly, that would not be a good and right response for us, and it would have no lasting impact. We gather to grieve a loss, but we gather mainly to ask, what is the Spirit of God doing in us through this? What will we allow the Spirit of God to do in us because of the life and death of Martin Holly. I personally intend to make the most of every drop of the cup of pain that this is to drink. It's hard to believe that this time last week we were broadcasting Martin's talk, where is Jesus? He was watching it with us and he's bound to have been pleased. In my view, it was his best preaching ever. For preaching is to be an announcement of good news and what Martin announced was the best news ever. It's four points for these. Jesus is home. Jesus is high up. Jesus is here. Jesus will appear. Jesus is home and now in spirit 
Martin is at home with him. The New Testament, in my view, is not explicit about what Martin is actually experiencing now. It says, absent from the body and present with the Lord. That is good. Jesus is high up was his next point. That's good news also because it means that Jesus is exalted above every other thing in this present evil age of death and separation. And Jesus is high above everything else in the age to come also. Soon, Jesus is going to demonstrate that he is high above every enemy of his, including that last enemy, which is death. Jesus is here. That's good news too not least because Martin is no longer here. Jesus is here by his spirit, and we're going to hear some of that again from Martin himself at the end of this meeting, just so that you are aware. We're going to show a clip from last week's talk to finish this meeting. Jesus will appear. Well, that's really the best news of all. If any part of the gospel as proclaimed by Jesus and then as believed by Martin is truth, then it's all truth. This means that we only left Martin's body on Thursday in the ground on a temporary basis. And Jesus will appear again and with his voice wake Martin up and say, let's go. We have more work to do ruling and reigning in the universe. That's the hope of every Christian. Everyone's eyesight will be fine then, so Martin's going to need to get another vocation. Yes, last week's message was Martin's best. And I'd love to see his face if we told him that there were 1,500 views on YouTube. He did work hard at preaching, but he knew that preaching and teaching in public was not his primary gift. He did love when the Bible was taught in clear and applicable ways. He would say to me, I like it when you have an illustration of how this actually works in practice. Martin had many other gifts that were used to serve others so well. He was pastoral. He was a master at connecting with and shepherding people on a one-to-one -one basis. As his daughter Rebecca told us on Thursday, her dad was always looking out for those on the margins and drawing them in. Martin was in the secret service. He served so many people secretly in many ways, always away from the public gaze. And he was generous with his time and money. Many of us have enjoyed his generosity. He gave our family a large gift in 2017 to attend a conference in California, USA. He was a master at being people, at being faithful to people over the long haul. He was a master at encouraging people to become the person that God was calling them to be. He did not want people to become like anybody other than themselves and who they were called to be. He was my most ardent supporter in fully embracing who I am as leader. Martin was also prophetic. He had prophetic gifts. He often spoke forth what God was currently saying. He frequently shared prophetic words with people, and some were quite significant, including prophesying the birth of children. He often received prophetic pictures that brought life and context to a situation and imparted faith. I, we, have been on the receiving end of some of those. And he was, he was very keen that we would make much more room for the ministry of the prophetic within our church. And this will be a large part of his legacy. And that leads me on to another area that I will probably miss the most. That is praying with Martin. We had found a synergy in praying together, especially for Connect and all you who are part of it. You get to know a man when you pray with him, for you get a window into his soul in terms of his view of God. 
Martin and I used to meet early on Sunday mornings. And I'll say this, anything good that has happened through our leadership was because of us praying together. Not long ago, we prayed that the Lord would speak over us prophetically and that he would send New Testament prophets to us to confirm the direction we thought we should go. And that's what happened. This has been a definitive period of hearing God's voice culminating in the crossing over announcement last week. And Martin believed we needed to be bold and brave about making this announcement, which was less information and more declaration. Five years ago, more or less exactly, five years ago next week, he and I were in Sheffield together, Sheffield, England together. It was a three dimensional discipleship conference, 3DM conference. And that's where the connecting up in and out concept came from. And we, we had a great time. Martin wined and dined me in the best restaurants Sheffield has to offer. And well, it's Sheffield, but he wouldn't let me buy a thing. And he bought extra leg room seats on the flight because after all, his legs were so long. And we talked quite a bit about our hopes and vision for the future. And one evening, we talked about what might be happening in five years. Yes, five years time. Well, Martin has experienced his ultimate crossing over. And we're left to experience a different kind of crossing over together. Just by the way, some of what we hoped would be happening in five years was the development of life on life discipleship, especially for new believers. Much more missional expression locally and the preparation and formation of new leaders so we could be done without. Recently, we had discussed his exit strategy and this wasn't it. Recently, again, we recognized that although this had not been achieved anywhere near how we had hoped it would be, we were perhaps, we are perhaps on the front end of it. Two weeks ago, Thursday passed, we decided to have a meeting on Port Stewart Strand it was our first meeting after the easing of lockdown restrictions. It felt great, to be honest. We we're like two school friends meeting up. <laughs> we drank flat whites and reminisced about our conversations in Sheffield five years earlier. That was our reference point. We were excited. Well, well, I was excited. How could you tell if Martin was excited or not? Nevertheless, I'm so glad we had that conversation. So this is the time to cross over, no retreat. Martin would tell us to cross over into what God has for us. He would say, go for it, be bold, be brave. He would not shout it from the front. He would tell me to do that. But I, yeah, I would hear it on WhatsApp messages. Many of them, constant reinforcement, constant reinforcement. Be bold, Paul, be brave. In the last five years, Martin had absolute consistency of purpose. Even when I did not. And in terms of our partnership, we were like an iceberg. I'm the bit you could see above the surface and he, and laterally Barry was the huge mass below the surface. So, in conclusion, because of what I've said and other things that are more private, I do believe that Martin's death is mysterious, mysteriously significant. It's a mysteriously significant moment. God is speaking. But that doesn't diminish the pain one iota for Carol, 
and Jonathan and Stephen and Philip and Rebecca and for us his friends. His life was such a gift to us. And perhaps in time, not yet, by grace, we will be able to say the same about his death. His sudden death reminds us that you can prepare for the future, but you cannot plan for it. In the week leading up to Martin's death, I had been thinking quite often, every single day in fact, about a scripture from James 4. James 4, 13 to 17 reads, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you're boast in, now you boast in arrogance and all such boasting is evil. But there's another verse that's not often taught on when those previous verses that I have read have been taught on. It says this, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Martin Holly's life and death reminds us that life is like a vapor and can end very suddenly. And we do not know what will happen tomorrow. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. To him it is sin means to him he misses the mark, he misses the target. Go look up what the word sin means in verse 17 of James 4. It's the missing of the mark. So if you want to hit God's target for your life, then... If there is good that you know to do today, do it today. Is there someone you need to forgive? Do it today. Is there something you need to ask forgiveness for? Go do it today. Is there something you need to give up? Do it today. Is there something you need to give away? Do it today. Martin showed us how to live that way. Barry, I'm going to hand back to you just now. If you can uh, hear me, just indicate that you can hear me. Good, good, thank you. Uh, so we're now going to open the floor, so to speak, uh, just to anyone who would like to share a memory, a tribute, a celebration of uh, Martin's life. Um, and I think it's important that we do this. Um, so if you would like to share something, you can just indicate to us in the chat function at the bottom of the page and Mark, um, who is in the background hosting this, uh, will see your message and then we'll be able to call your name whenever it's your turn. Uh, and just to avoid any confusion, uh, Mark will unmute you centrally so you don't need to unmute yourself. Um, for those uh, watching us on YouTube streaming, um, please feel free to share in the comments um, section there as well. Uh, obviously, you won't be able to share uh, through uh, us on Zoom. Uh, can I suggest that we try to keep our sharing concise to allow others a chance to speak to? Uh, so no sermons, please. Uh, just personal thanksgiving. Uh, and perhaps we can offer our condolences to the family at another time, uh, not this time. This time is actually about celebrating who Martin was. And I have to say, I'll be disappointed if, uh, if nobody includes some of Martin's epic 
uh, dad humor or the fact that somehow he's the only person I know that was able to pull off wearing his mobile phone on his belt and still look smart. So, um, so to begin, uh, William Kennedy uh, is going to uh, read just what uh, his tribute and what he had written. So William, uh, if you go ahead. Martin Holly, man of God, faithful servant, loving brother. God's triple verdict on Job's life is yours. He was, a bla he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. You'll find that in Job 1, verse 1, again in verse 8, and at 2, verse 3. Although Martin was my junior in years, he was my senior in consistent Christian character. To me, he was a model and a mentor in a quiet, unassuming way. He traveled the same spiritual journey ahead of me as my example, and yet was alongside me as my brother and behind me as my encourager. Martin coaxed me, cajoled me, counseled me, comforted me, even coerced me when I needed it. He understood where I came from, what I struggled with, and with his impish wit, how I often needed to lighten up. His final address to us is his most fitting epitaph and most challenging legacy. Integrity is a great virtue and Martin epitomized it. He was a steady, loyal, wise, faithful and servant-hearted leader. I shall miss him. We all shall miss him. And yet Carl and his family shall miss him most. I thank God for every remembrance of you, Martin, man of God, faithful servant, loving brother. Thank you, William. Uh, there might be a couple of seconds of a delay between uh, other people wanting to share, so please um, feel free to do so. Say, go ahead, Davy. I, I just want to read a text that I received from Martin on 11th of June 2019 at 7.37 a.m. Hi, Davy. I was praying for you and Linda this morning. I sense God saying, take the window of opportunity in Namibia, hoping that this will help guide your decision making, Martin. I responded with a very long text because this was didn't make much sense to me. As far as I was concerned, we had taken the window of opportunity 15 years previous. But when we arrived in Namibia, we arrived to a very different situation from what we totally expected. As a result of that message from Martin, it prepared us that God was actually moving our ministry 1,800 kilometers north to the border of Angola that previously we would not have had the courage to do. Those few words take the window of opportunity in Namibia. Martin spoke those inspired by the Spirit of God and only time and eternity uh, will judge the weight of them, but we certainly acted on it. And we thank God for his prophetic gift and has been stated quietly, unassumingly, but it, it, is, it will affect many lives. Thank you, Davy and Linda. Who else would like to say something, share something? Appreciate it might be difficult. One thing that I've been uh, really reflecting on this week, um, and 
that's just hasn't left me is that Martin was, was such an encourager, and that, that's been noted already. Um, but it was the way he encouraged, he was such a thoughtful, um, intentional, and often that word secret encourager has been mentioned. And um, I'm, I'm so thankful to have been on the receiving end of that encouragement. Um, very recently, even uh, only one week before he, he left us. And, but I'm more thankful to have known him and seen an example of what, what an encourager looks like and how to, how to do that in such a God-honoring way. And I'm sure there's many of you that can uh, no doubt vouch for Martin's encouragement in your own life. And you can testify to how God used that. Um, but I'm just so thankful uh, for the four years that I've known Martin and for uh, what he has taught me and what I've seen in his life that has been such an encouragement and challenge. Um, First Thessalonians uh, 5, 9 to 11 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as you are already doing. And Martin was a great example of that. And I'm thankful, as I'm sure we all are, for his many, many uh, gifts to the church, but especially that of encouragement for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. For those of you who haven't um, seen the message, Russ uh, McCahey has just sent a message. Our hearts go out to all our dear friends and connect from everyone in North Africa. May the Lord bless and keep you in his peace. Uh, Rob and Debbie would like to uh, share. So, uh, Hi, everyone. Hi. It's, it's good to see uh, <laughs> you all. Here's us. Here's, uh, and Caleb. So that's the five of us here. The, uh, the, Two other ones are away just now, so um, yeah, we just wanted to. Um, obviously, we're we're here in South Africa. Some of you know us, and some of you don't. But we were fr we're from the Barn Fellowship, and now from Connect. And um, we were a lot younger before we <laughs> before we left. Uh, but we, we left in two thousand and three um, with with three small children, four year old twins, and a, a eighteen month old baby who's eighteen years old now. That's her there, and. Um, before we obviously came to South Africa, we were working um, in Northern Ireland and living in Northern Ireland and we were just getting on with making money and doing our stuff and helping people as best we could. But we knew that we felt called to come and serve overseas. And for a year and a half, about 18 months every Monday from eight until nine o'clock, a handful of people came to our house and prayed with us. And Martin and Carol were one of those few. And um, now with teenagers, it's hard to believe that when you have babies, no one else has any kids, but people used to come to us in the evening and spend a lot of time with us. And I remember the day that we, well, not the day that we left, but the, our last Sunday that Martin interviewed us in church. And it was just so, it, it was so meticulous, had a whole number of points and little stories and little ways of doing stuff. But was just so proud of, um, of us and, and really, really encouraged us to come. And it wasn't just for that one Sunday, but for just so many weeks and months um, beforehand and certainly um, the Holy family as a family embraced us and were, and were really instrumental with us coming and also supporting us whilst we have been here um, in, in just so many so many ways um, and I know that when we were coming um, there's a there can be a big fear in, in leaving home and the things that you know and what and what and what, and what to do um, and I know that my Debs would, 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 would like to speak. Hi, um, just a very quick thing, memory of Martin. Um, one of the nights that Martin and Carl were praying with us in our house in Bellamy, um, I was really, really scared about coming to South Africa with three small children. And um, we, Martin just said simply one night, um, Deb, he, he shared about their time in Afghanistan and what it was like living there when there was bombing and shooting and stuff. And he just said, Deb, if you're in the palm of God's hand, that's the safest place to be. And in all our years here, 
And that has come back to me so many times when we've been struggling. And so I just want to really honour him for his integrity and for, for not just walking with us, but just being such a support as that both him and Carl have been throughout the years for us. And he was right. We are in the palm of God's hand and it is the safest place to be. Yeah. And then just, just, just to, um, to the Ollie kids, I just want to say thanks for sharing your dad with us and so many people. It's been a great, um, it's been great. Thanks. Thank you, Robin Davy. Okay, um, I'm just going to say something very, very short, very brief. One of the things that Naomi and I had always, well, I had always prayed about um, before coming to the barn was for a, a mentor, someone just that bit older to, to guide and to share with. And I really found that with uh, Martin. Um, we used to run together for years, two mornings a week. And I mean, I would, I'm not quite half his age, but I would uh, be struggling out of bed. And Martin would be standing there six thirty in the morning, and he really taught and trained me discipline in that. Um, and he just shared so much wisdom through a, a cup of coffee, and just spend time with us on marriage and, and chatting through. And something, it's just something we're so appreciative of. And uh, I think, yeah, one other thing. Um, and one last thing, just to say, one thing I really appreciated with Martin was. He didn't always feel the need to say something, but what he did say really counted, and it gave me confidence in that, and something I've just, you know, just have absolutely loved. I just want to say a couple of things, um, just to say to, to Carol and the family, just that we love you so much, and we're with you in all of this. Um, we got to know Martin and Carl so well when we came to um, the barn initially. Um, we shared home group with them for for many many years, and we're so um, blessed to be sitting with them and sharing with them and under Martin's ministry as well as he led at different times. Um, we appreciated their friendship so much, their support, their love, their guidance when we went through difficult times and they were there for us always and we appreciate that. Martin was such a consistent guy. He was a godly man, he was humble um, and he was a great, great friend. He was always the same, even when they were going, Martin and Carl were going through difficult times, Martin was consistent in his faith and his love uh, for everyone. Martin was the most gracious golf partner you could ever go out with. Uh, I'd so miss not playing Port Stewart with him. And certainly he was the snobbiest dresser that we ever had in the barn and the, the Connect Centre. God bless you. Thinking about Martin this week, uh, I was led to Pack 7.54, and I'm just going to share. Uh, when the council members heard Stephen's speech, they were angry and furious, but Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked toward heaven, where he saw our glorious God and Jesus standing at his right side. Then Stephen said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right side of God. And that's, uh, my thoughts were just drawn towards that. Uh, it's probably uh, not thinking of Martin before, but after his death, uh, I saw him in probably a different light. So that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you. I will take the time, I suppose there's a message on Facebook, or sorry, uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. being uh, read out. Um, uh, it's uh, by Alice Mark. It says Martin faithfully visited Doug Douglas every week in the last four months of his life. They encouraged each other in the Lord, and now they are together. He was yeah. generous and always saw people on the edge. Um, Willie, Willie Patterson would like to share. Willie, if you can unmute yourself. Um, the thing that has struck me most about Martin, and even since he's passed away, it's been really reinforced many times, is how much he did with and for people 
under the horizon. And the impact that he had on many people's lives in a quiet, gentle way. Yeah. I know that for ourselves, he did marriage prep for Michael and Lucy. And uh, we were at a party at, in his home in Balnamore uh, as the millennium turned round. And our daughter Heidi and her husband now Daniel were engaged that night, announced their engagement that night. So we have things from way back to just remember that are precious. But it's particularly a verse that I want to share from Second Samuel 23. And it is about leadership. Uh, halfway through verse 3. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth upon a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. And the way it's written in this version, it's not clear whether that means the Lord dawns on them, the Lord's like rain, or whether the person who leads is like that. But it dawns on you, the influence that Martin has had. It's not in your face. It dawns on you as you hear people sharing the benefit he's been in their life. And it is like rain that makes grass to grow, that makes others grow. It makes, it's a benefit and life giving to others. And I, I think Martin's influence um, epitomizes that and we should honor him for it. Thank you, William Hazel. I might just take the opportunity to say that uh, many years ago uh, when Wendy and I uh, just got married, it was Martin and Carol uh, that did our pre-marriage uh, counseling course. And they are the reason that we uh, came to the barn and uh, stayed in the barn. So I want to say thank you uh, to that. Um, Martin Cam Campbell would like to barn. speak from New Zealand. Yes. If we could bring Martin in, please, that would be great. Um, when, I, when we arrived in Afghanistan in 1997, Martin and Carol and the kids had just left. And I guess having another Martin from Northern Ireland arrive and they thought everybody was called Martin. And I guess they were a bit reassured that this one had a full head of hair. But from then on, it was only disappointment because <laughs> I could never live up to, I don't know, just the, the quality of work and the integrity of, of just input that Martin gave to so many um, within that program. And Martin and a couple of others were very instrumental in starting an opticians program there in, in Kabul initially, but it's gone around the country and now it's part of the long standing um, work in Afghanistan that Martin started. Martin has left that there and it has grown and the Afghans have taken it over. And yeah, um, we got such a shock, our love to the whole Holly family. And I see Carol and Philip there and our love to them and to the rest of the family. But um, yeah, we were privileged to know them, even though we never got to overlap in Afghanistan with them. I think it both um, it took a bit of our hearts, that country, and um, bonded us together. But our love and blessings to you all. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we're going to, yes, Nigel and Naomi, I would like to share something. Go ahead, Nigel. Hi. Um... Yeah, I think for us, uh, we share the feeling of disbelief when we heard about, about Martin. Um, there's a number of things that come to my mind when I think of Martin. Um, one is his quick wit. Uh, he, uh, he was very quick in, in response with his wit and always left me stumbling trying to work out his, um, his response two or three sentences later. Um, but... I think the main thing that comes to mind is what we've been shared already is his encouragement um, and his generosity 
Martin was always the first to encourage and would encourage over the long haul. Um, Martin and Carl came to visit us uh, when we were in India. And uh, that was such an encouragement to us. Um, Martin was first customer on our rickshaw tours that we were doing at that time. Um, he also got to speak at Al Salama Eye Institute, got a standing ovation from the students. Um, but yeah, it was just the real encouragement and it's the encouragement behind the scenes, I think it means the most because you know that it's genuine um, and it's not done for show. It's done out of love. Uh, so that's what really sticks with me, the blessing that we have received through that encouragement. Um, so yeah, we just thank, uh, very thankful for Martin and for Carl and for the encouragement and blessing that they have poured, in, poured into our lives. Thank you, Nigel and Naomi. Uh, Carol obviously had sent us a message as well last night just to say thanks for all the love shown to me uh, this week in so many uh, practical ways uh, and caring ways. It's a privilege to be part of you as a church uh, family. Um, so I think. Um, that's all of the sharing um, that we have this morning. I'm sure people will send uh, other types of messages to Carol and the family in the coming weeks and months. I'm gonna hand over to Paul. Uh, Paul will, will close. Thanks, Barry. Um, today I was to speak on Endued. That is the receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Martin edited the, our weekly e-news and he contacted me to see what the title was to be for today. Uh, and I said, in Jude, and he replied, great, go for it. Perhaps we have been far too nuanced in, our, in terms of our reference about the need and potential of being in Jude with the power of the Holy Spirit in terms of being clothed with God's power to do God's work. But Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit, he poured out what can be seen and heard. So we're going to give Martin the last word on this today. And this meeting will close immediately after this video ends. So thank you for joining us today. Come, Holy Spirit. So we have a God-man in heaven today. We have access to the power center of the universe. Luke wrote his gospel and the book of Acts to the Gentiles. He wanted his readers to see Jesus as perfect, but also God-man bringing together the physical and the spiritual, a real human being, not a phantom. Jesus healed and fed people. He was concerned about their physical health as well as their souls. He wants us to partner with him in restoring people's bodies and souls to health, wholeness and salvation. Jesus was and is the complete expression of God in human body. He wasn't a superhero from a comic like Superman. He was human in the very fullest sense. His body aged, he experienced full range of human needs and emotions. Jesus can help us because he's the mighty God, but also because he walked the same human path that we walk. Jesus did life the way we do, with the help of the Holy Spirit. He really does know and care about what we're going through. C.S. Lewis wrote, When Jesus became man, he did not cease to be God. And when he ascended, he did not cease to be man. Karl Barth, a theologian, also put it, The dust of heaven, the dust of earth, it now sits in heaven. Jesus had to return to heaven. He himself said, that he had to leave so that the Holy Spirit would come. If he had stayed on earth, 
His physical presence would have limited the spread of the good news. He could only be in one place at one time, physically, but through the Holy Spirit, he could be spiritually present everywhere. Resurrection for Jesus was incomplete without the ascension. The ascension made Jesus unique, even from others like Lazarus who had been raised from the dead, but not ascended. So Jesus is home. Jesus is high up. And Jesus is here by the Holy Spirit. Between the resurrection and the ascension were 40 days of Jesus appearing and disappearing. Jesus' resurrection body was able to go through walls and lock doors, unlike ours. But in other words, in other ways, his body was like ours, able to eat and drink and speak, etc. After those 40 days, Jesus left the sight of the disciples, promising to send the Holy Spirit soon and always to be at their side. But the disciples must have been confused. On the Mount of Olives, where they were standing, the Messiah was supposed to return to Israel from the prophet Zechariah's prophecy. They had been on the Mount of Olives before. They had been on Palm Sunday, on Good Friday. It was a place of unfinished business. Was this not the moment for Jesus to descend the Mount, storm into Jerusalem and take over? But instead, Jesus has gone in exactly the opposite direction. He ascends, he disappears. He tells them they have a job to do, to preach the good news all over the world, and then he disappears in the cloud. What was that all about? Must have been in their minds and hearts. Any devout Jew would see the comparison here with Elijah in the Old Testament, promising his successor Elisha a double portion of his spirit, and then Elijah was taken from Elisha. It was much more than just a departure. It was a passing of power, of authority and responsibility. Jesus was gloriously unpredictable, wonderfully messy, never going in the expected direction. The disciples expected him to take Jerusalem by storm, but to their surprise, he left that task to them. Now out of sight, Jesus, 10 days later, sent the Holy Spirit, and by his Spirit, he would never leave them. That promise is to us also. The Holy Spirit collapses the distance between heaven and earth, connecting us to the living, risen and ascended Christ. In a sense, this connection between us and Jesus through the Holy Spirit is like the ultimate conference call. Jesus is now accessible everywhere and our heart connection with him is actually closer than it was between him and the disciples. Think for a moment, can you remember a gift from your father or mother when they had been away for a while and returned? I remember my dad returning from Africa after a long time brought me a water pistol camera. What a joy that was to um, wet people with that. In Ephesians 4, Paul explains a picture from Psalm 68 of God as conqueror, marching to the gates and taking tribute from a fallen city. He compares this to Jesus victorious over Satan. He says, when Christ triumphantly ascended to heaven, he gave gifts to the church. Jesus may be saying, Jean, here's a prophetic gift. George, here's a gift of evangelism. Mike, here's a pastoral gift. Lydia, here's a gift of teaching. Arnold, here's an apostolic gift. To each of us, spiritual gifts have been given. Gifts that Jesus won for us at great cost. These gifts are needed to win the world for him. Let's not neglect them. The song UK Blessing featuring about 65 church groups in the UK has had nearly 3 million viewings online and delivers a message of God being with us and for us. It illustrates how the church can bless the nation. 
We are God's gift to a needy world. Jesus' last words on earth were about our calling to make disciples. What's been called the Great Commission is our job now. Jesus said that we should go and preach salvation. So Ascension Day is a good time to reevaluate our mission. Have we got mission and making disciples as our goal? How can we be more involved in our community to reach that goal? Can we be more effective in support of global mission? Scripps Union did a survey among young people in England and Wales recently and they found that 95% of under 18s don't go to church. Think of our geographic location as the Connect Christian Fellowship, near local schools, near the town centre. Can we take this opportunity to reach some of the 95%? Jesus said, when we go in his name, there'll be miraculous signs. Demonised will be freed. New tongues will be spoken. Miracles and healings will be seen. But that will only happen when we step out of our comfort zone in faith. 